Allen again, and what we're going to do today is go over the last eight lectures that we've spent together. I want to really reinforce with you the most important learning points that we've gone over and make sure that the most important recommendations that we made throughout this series are crystal clear in your mind. So one of the things I've been asking you throughout this series is to get really clear on what is your why. Why is it that you wanted to commit to this series? How is it that you've been able to stay motivated throughout these last eight lectures? What we're going to cover today are the top 10 ideas that we've learned together throughout this series and review the top 10 recommendations that we've had. So getting back to the question of my why, why is it that I wanted to develop this program and have us go on this journey together? Well, the most important thing to me is to truly improve the quality of life for older adults. I knew that after listening to thousands of my patients and reading many, many journal articles about what older adults wanted, they really wanted to learn about the brain. The problem was they didn't have a trustworthy resource to get that information. We know that older adults tend to get their information about the brain from the news and the media, and I just knew that that was a recipe that was ripe for disaster. I was motivated to bring the world of brain science directly to you in your own community in person and also in our online community. One of the most important things to me was to reduce the exploitation that I saw as a fundamental part of the brain fitness industry as it stands today. I felt strongly that we needed a more holistic and scientifically based approach to brain health. One that doesn't separate brain health from the other very important aspects of our health, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I've seen so many patients come into my practice telling me that they're spending very precious resources, time, money, and hope on products that I know have no scientific basis whatsoever. Yet I've been immersed in this academic medicine world for the last few years that has taught me so much about the brain. And I felt very strongly that you yourself had a right to know this information. My job was to try to communicate it to you in a clear, engaging way that motivated you for action. So what I want to do now is have us go through the top 10 learning points that we've learned over our journey together so far. The first one is that brain health very largely depends on the interaction between our genes and our environment. It's when these two factors come together that we either activate our genes for things like dementia or we're able to suppress the gene expression and people do not develop those symptoms. The environmental piece of brain health is dependent on knowing your personal risk factors and lowering them and the way to increase your personal cognitive reserve. And that's been a big part of our journey to date, is really getting you on board with what are the most common risk factors that people have control over, and that if they just knew better, they would be able to reduce them. And what are the brain-related health activities, the social-related health activities, the physical-related health activities, the spiritual-related health activities that truly contribute to brain health? We talked about the difference between modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, so let's just review those again briefly. There really is only two non-modifiable risk factors when we're talking about brain health as we age. These are risk factors that you really can't do anything about. The first one is age. Now, age is the number one risk factor for developing dementia, but remember, one thing that we learned together is that dementia is not a normal part of aging. That's a big stereotype, that if we just live long enough, we will start to develop symptoms of dementia, and it's just not true. The other non-modifiable risk factor that you can't do anything about are specific gene mutations that predispose us to developing dementia. No matter what we do, we could be as healthy as possible and we're still going to get that specific type of dementia. Now on the other hand, we have modifiable risk factors. And what these are, are risk factors that we can exert a large amount of control over. These are things that we can actually do something about. And that's really been at the heart of this brain health series, is I wanted to educate you about these important risk factors so A, you could really understand them, and B, you knew the evidence-based, the scientifically-based recommendations to do something about them. We spent a whole lecture talking about how heart health equals brain health. And what we've learned is that there's really three risk factors that most negatively affect brain health as we age. This is high blood pressure or hypertension, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. I would say untreated sleep apnea comes in at a quick fourth. 
We spent some time learning all about vascular health and how the brain's primary fuel is oxygen and glucose and that the way that the brain gets all this fuel is through the vascular delivery system. We now know that there are four primary arteries that go into the brain. We've got our two carotids in the front and the two vertebrals in the back. We also know that we have a system of teeny tiny little blood vessels in the center subcortical part of the brain that do a lot of important things. The problem is, is that these little blood vessels are very sensitive to damage, particularly as we get older. We now know that it's damage to these little blood vessels that is probably related to a lot of what we consider to be the mild normal changes of aging. Specifically, trouble remembering names, trouble quickly calling up information as you once did, and that ability to multitask quickly, to go back and forth between things that you want to focus on as efficiently and successfully as you once did. We talked about other risk factors too, specifically things that we put into our body, things like alcohol, our diet, prescription medications, and supplements. I hope that after listening to that information, you feel like a much more informed consumer, that when you see an ad that has a wildly exaggerated claim, you're not just gonna buy it hook, line, and sinker. You're gonna take a step back and evaluate it more critically. One of the other risk factors that we spent time talking about was social isolation and chronic stress. They might not be two factors that come to your mind quickly when you think about brain health, but I really hope that I've convinced you that they're absolutely essential to successful cognitive aging. We absolutely have to learn better coping skills for managing chronic stress, and we really need to be vitally involved in a social environment. Now remember, that's different for every person. That depends on if you're an extrovert, if you're an introvert, and those two things actually change over the course of our lifetime. That was one contribution from psychologist Carl Jung. He helped us to understand that at different phases of our life, we're more outgoing versus more introverted, and that's okay. But at our core, we are social animals and we need to be around each other. We need to have our village of people. Now, for some of you, that might be a very big village. For others of us, we're very content having a small handful of trustworthy people around us that can provide us with support and resources when we need them. It's a really critical part of brain health. I taught you about the concept of cognitive reserve, which comes from us from Dr. Stern in New York. This is a fundamental concept for understanding brain health. He began hypothesizing about the concept of cognitive reserve after becoming aware of several autopsies studies that showed physiological signs of Alzheimer's disease in autopsied brains in people that in everyday life did not show the symptoms. And that was really a revelation in brain science because we started to think about the difference between structure of the brain, the physiology of the brain, and the function of the brain. What does the brain actually do in real life, which of course is the most important thing. His theory was that some brains over the course of a very enriched life, education, complex jobs, working around a lot of people, made the connections in the brain stronger and more resistant to different brain diseases, particularly those that were age-related, like dementia. His idea was that the more cognitive reserve you have, the more brain disease is needed to result in impairment in everyday life. The question becomes, how can we exploit this finding for our own benefit? How is it that we can add to our cognitive reserve every day to increase our chances of fighting back against brain conditions? I want you to think of cognitive reserve like making deposits into your brain bank. Everything that you do throughout the course of your day, particularly when it has a complex element to it and you really have to focus, is improving the quality of the connections within your brain. So let's take a few minutes to talk about how you can make cognitive reserve personal to you or somebody that you care about. The best thing that you could do would be to find something that you or someone you know used to really enjoy, a hobby, something that they started off as as a beginner and slowly over time built up more expertise. In a previous lecture, we talked about piano playing as the perfect example. Many people started off taking piano lessons as a child. And remember, one of the things that Dr. Stern says is that it's the earlier, more complex activities that we engaged in that are probably the strongest 
strongest foundations in the brain. So one of the things that you can do or encourage somebody that you love to do is to get back into an old hobby and reactivate those brain networks. Another really important point that we covered together was the difference between normal brain aging and when you should be worried. The big difference that I hope I taught you is that you cannot have a diagnosis of dementia until the cognitive symptoms, the thinking and the behavior changes that happen with dementia are to the point that they interfere with everyday life. And if you remember, we talked about three areas that you wanna watch out for, financial management, Things like managing the checkbook, remembering to pay the bills on time and accurately, remembering to take medications, and driving. You cannot have a diagnosis of dementia if you don't have problems in those three areas. There are four things that happen in the brain in normal brain aging that you might have noticed yourself or in a loved one. And I want to reassure you that these things are completely normal. The first thing is that we know that our vision and our hearing declines with age. About 70-75% of older adults after a certain age, 75 or 80, have clinically diagnosed hearing loss, but not nearly that amount of older adults are actually being treated for it. Now there's a lot of people who've been prescribed hearing aids, the problem is they don't wear them consistently. That can be a huge help in improving someone's quality of life and making sure that they've actually heard the information so their brain has really good quality information to learn and remember. The second thing that happens in normal aging is just as our bodies slow down a little bit, so does the brain. Processing speed, especially for more complex tasks, gets a little bit slower. And remember, what I want you to keep remembering is that changes in normal brain aging are mild. The next thing people can notice is a little bit more trouble with multitasking. I've talked with so many patients who tell me I used to be able to juggle 20 balls in the air, and now you might be having trouble listening to a television show and also carrying on a conversation with your husband. The final thing that happens in the normally aging brain is just a little bit of trouble with new learning. Of course, older adults are completely capable of new learning. The change is that you might have to hear something more than one time to really fully absorb it. One of the most common questions that I get as a neuropsychologist is what exactly is dementia? How is dementia different from something like Alzheimer's disease? So throughout the course of our time together, I hope that you're walking away with a really clear sense of what exactly dementia is. Let's just go over it quickly. Dementia is the loss of the ability to think, to remember, to reason to the point where it affects those instrumental activities of daily living. Dementia occurs when once healthy brain cells either die or lose their connections to other brain cells, reducing communication within the brain. Dementia is caused by different diseases that happen in the brain. So if someone tells you or a loved one, we're worried about dementia, what you need to know is that you have a right to know what type of dementia. And why this is critical is because the type of dementia absolutely dictates the best treatment for the person. I've seen so many people who will come to see me in my office and in their medical records, it will just say dementia. And I try to empower them the best I can to have them understand that's really not good enough. Dementia is a very generic, broad term. And while it tells us something about what's happening in the person's brain, it's really the beginning of the conversation conversation. I hope I've taught you about what a neuropsychologist is, that we are experts in the brain with PhDs in clinical psychology and a few extra years of training, that we have the ability to assess and treat all aspects of brain health. I hope that you've learned that dementia is not just a memory problem, that it's really a syndrome and that there are three primary symptoms. Yes, we absolutely have cognitive symptoms, but we also have mood and behavior changes and those functional changes. Those are those changes in everyday life. All dementias are a combination of these three things. So let's review what we mean by each one of those components. When we think of the cognitive changes in dementia, most commonly you see people with trouble in new learning, memory, and language. People who were once able to pick up on things very quickly seem to have newfound difficulty getting the information into their brain. Trouble finding words that goes beyond the normal related changes that I told you about a few slides ago. 
What I want you to know is that these changes have to be different for the person, and like I keep saying, they have to affect everyday life. The second grouping of symptoms is changes in mood and behavior. What we talked about a few lectures ago is that for some types of dementia, these are actually the leading symptoms. And this is very commonly seen in Alzheimer's disease. And what patients' families typically tell me is that a few years before the memory problem started, when they look back, they notice that there were actually other changes. What they often notice is that the person showed a decrease in interest and participation in activities that they've always enjoyed. Another common mood and behavior symptom is increased irritability and more quickly to get frustrated. And this is probably due to two things. One are the biological changes that happen in brain chemistry as a part of different dementias. But also think about it, for many of these people, they don't have coping skills with dealing with their words not coming out as quickly as they once did, with people telling them, I just told you that yesterday. I think any of us would find that to be incredibly frustrating. But this can be a difficult symptom for families to interpret. And many times in my experience, people start to worry, maybe the person's depressed. Maybe they're having some kind of a mental health problem. This is why it's so important to make sure that you advocate for yourself or a loved one to to get a gold standard evaluation of the brain. We talked about that in a previous lecture, and what that includes is a trip to your primary care doctor to make sure through blood tests and urine tests that there's not any treatable conditions going on, like a vitamin B deficiency, too high of blood sugar, anemia, or something like a urinary tract infections. All four of those can cause acute and temporary mental status changes that with treatment can be reversed. Once the person has gone through that screening process, they should see a neurologist or a neuropsychologist. The next steps will include a picture of the brain, either a CT scan of the head or an MRI of the brain, mostly as a way to rule out different things that could be happening. As you now know, MRIs and CT scans cannot diagnose the vast majority of dementia. Now, the one exception is vascular dementia, and this is dementia that happens as a result of one or more strokes. The next element of the gold standard brain evaluation is an in-depth and comprehensive interview with the person we're concerned about and also someone that knows them well. It's really important that we have enough time to understand exactly how the symptoms began and how they've changed over time. That information is absolute gold to a neuropsychologist because that tells us, did this start gradually? Was it sudden? Has it gotten worse over time? Does it fluctuate over time? And we need the perspective of both the person and what we call the informant, the person that knows them very well. Many times there's biological reasons that the person themselves who is experiencing the mild early stages of dementia, they do not have the insight or awareness to help you understand exactly what it is that's been changing. That's a neurological symptom called anasygnosia. It's very easy for us to sometimes think that the person just doesn't want to admit it. They're embarrassed about their memory changes. They don't want to admit what's going on. And that, of course, can sometimes be the case. But particularly in Alzheimer's disease, what you find is that is a biological symptom. That is not something that the person is consciously controlling. So I absolutely need to be talking in depth with people that know this particular person very well. I really need to know the specific changes that have happened over time and particularly how things are going in their everyday life. Because remember, you cannot have that diagnosis of dementia until there is impairment in that person's ability to get through the day independently. The final aspects of that gold standard evaluation are the paper and pencil testing that a neuropsychologist does. Now this does typically take a couple hours, but a good neuropsychologist is going to make you or your loved one feel very comfortable. Our goal is to get the very best performance out of the person on these tests. So our job is to really show that person a lot of respect and support as they go through the testing process. There's no tricks. The idea is that we're simply trying to understand the function of the brain. 
What is the brain capable of? One of the things we talked about was memory. And I hope you walked away understanding that memory is very complex. It's not as simple as good memory, bad memory. The only way that you can truly understand a memory problem is through this comprehensive paper and pencil testing that a neuropsychologist offers. We need to be able to break down complex cognitive functions like memory into all of their parts. If you listen to the memory talk that I did, what you would have walked away understanding is that there's all of these different aspects to memory. You have to be able to perceive it, you have to pay attention to it, you have to be interested in it, you have to be able to learn it, then you have to be able to find the information in your brain through a process called retrieval, and ultimately you have to be able to recognize it. Paper and pencil testing that a neuropsychologist does can tell you and your family exactly where the problem is taking place. Using our expertise in the brain, what we can do is then infer where in the brain the problem is happening. But remember when I said a few lectures back that what we care about as neuropsychologists is not just the brain. We really pride ourselves on treating and respecting the whole person. So our job is to understand the complex background that each of us come to the assessment with. A social person who's had a lifetime of experiences and relationships and jobs and activities and interests. Our real goal as neuropsychologists is to bring all of this together. We're very integrative brain scientists. We wanna take all the different parts and figure out for each specific person what is going on, and we use all that information to inform a personalized plan of care. When dementia isn't diagnosed early or accurately, people and family lose precious time. Do you know that there's memory medications on the market now? Well, if you listen to one of our talks, you know that there's two different classes of medications that can help folks with dementia. The way these medications work is they don't actually treat the underlying brain disease that's causing the dementia, but they're the very best that we have for now, and they're not medications that we had just a few decades ago. What these medications do is they stall the symptoms of dementia for a longer period of time from the point that the person starts taking the medication. So I think it's just common sense that we wanna get people diagnosed as early as possible and specifically know what type of dementia that they have to know if these medications are even going to help. When we talked about substances, one of the things I warned you about is something called polypharmacy. And what this means is taking too many medications. I know that a lot of you listening to this today wonder, should I really be taking all these pills? Now, I do want you to always keep in mind, I am not a physician. I am a PhD level brain scientist. So really you have to go to your primary care doctor or your neurologist to ask your specific questions about medication. But I do feel very comfortable in guiding and educating you about the information that we talked about in how substances affect the aging brain. And what you now know is that the more medications, the more problems we can get into with interactions. However, the unfortunate truth is that some of you do need all those medications, but I think there's also a group of you out there that are adding in extra things like over-the-counter supplements, herbs, and vitamins that are probably just complicating the picture more than it needs to be and increasing your risk of interaction and not offering you anything genuine in terms of your health, particularly your brain health. The way I think about dementia is that it's happening whether or not we give it a name. The minute we can identify exactly what's going on is the minute that you or someone in your family can start to take control. Like I said, these medications only work as soon as we get them in the person's body and brain, and we wanna try to get them in there as soon as possible. The goal is the longest quality of life possible and the highest level of independence. The other benefit of an early and accurate diagnosis of dementia is a chance to reduce the uncertainty and the anxiety that comes along with knowing there's something going on here, but I just can't put my finger on it. I know as a neuropsychologist that it can be scary to come to see a doctor like me, but our job is to help you understand that you truly will be better off for knowing the information that we're going to figure out together. A good neuropsychologist wants to work with you and your loved one to figure things out so that way your care can be customized to you. 
The other thing that we pride ourselves on following the gold standard evaluation of the brain is connecting people to community-based resources. Things like support groups, very specific therapeutic exercise groups can be very, very helpful for prolonging independence, quality of life, and keeping people's brain as healthy as it can be for as long a period of time as possible. One thing that research tells us is very important to older adults today is the concept of self-determination, wanting to be in charge of what happens to them. Once you know what's going on from a trusted professional, you're then put in the driver's seat of being able to really plan for your future, for you to be the one in charge of what happens to you. And remember, not all memory symptoms are due to dementia. We talked a few minutes ago about things like vitamin deficiency and anemia, but there's actually about a dozen other things that can cause memory problems that are treatable. So let's review those. We talked about medications in one of our talks, and we talked about something called the anticholinergic medications. These are medications that actually do the complete opposite of what the memory medications like Dinepazil that are on the market today through prescription do. These are medications that lower a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine that is absolutely essential for learning and memory. And I pointed you to a resource guide on the internet that's in your companion workbook where you can calculate your own personal anticholinergic burden score. This is where you can look at all the medications that you take, all the over-the-counters that you take, and calculate for yourself how many of these drugs have this anticholinergic property? I then want you to go and talk with your primary care doctor about your personal burden score and see if maybe there are newer medications that can replace some of the older ones that would reduce some of that burden on your brain. A lot of research has been done on this topic and one of the focuses has been on sleep medications, particularly over-the-counter medications. Any drug that's out there for sleep that has a PM on the end of it is particularly concerning for older adults. The PM is related to the fact that Benadryl is in those medications. There are some problems in addition to memory, including an increased fall risk that are very concerning to those of us who care about older adults. We talked about alcohol and how as the body and the brain age, we really do process alcohol differently on a metabolic level. This means that we need to change the amount of alcohol that we drink as we get older. Now, I'm definitely not up here telling you or someone you care about to stop drinking completely, but we really have to use the guidelines that have been set forward that are specific to older adults. What we talked about in that lecture is how things like kidney functioning, changes in liver functioning, and in the metabolic processes that happen in the brain change the availability of alcohol in our body and that this can be damaging. It's very damaging to different aspects of the brain, including balance and memory. We touched on the importance of sleep, and there's so many different aspects that are important to sleep in terms of physical, mental, and cognitive health. But as we look back on the most important points of this series, one of the things I really want you to take away is the importance of treating sleep apnea. This is a very common sleep disorder, but is very much untreated. Many, many people do not use their CPAP every single night as they are supposed to. Why this is so important is because it hurts the brain in two ways. I'll tell you about those in a minute, but the treatment is so effective. Science tells us that even within two weeks of wearing your CPAP for five or six hours a night, you can absolutely see benefits in the negative effects that have come about because of the sleep apnea. It really gets us in two ways, but first let's define what sleep apnea really is. An apnea is when you stop breathing. Most people who've been diagnosed have undergone something called a sleep study. And to meet criteria through Medicare to get the diagnosis and qualify for the CPAP breathing machine, last time I checked, you had to stop breathing between eight and 10 times per night. Now, I think that that's pretty extreme. I think not breathing one time per night would qualify for me, but according to insurance government guidelines, this is what we're working with. When that happens, the oxygen saturation in the blood hits rock bottom. And most people who've had a sleep study who get diagnosed, what they find when they look at that report is that they stop breathing 
dozens, if not hundreds of times. What happens is that the oxygen availability to the brain goes through the floor and you don't have access to one of the primary fuels that you need in order for your brain to work well. Over time, this results in micro brain damage. The second thing that happens is that these apneas, the stopping breathing, happen to occur most commonly when we're in our deepest sleep, stages four and five, five being REM sleep. What you learned in our sleep lecture is that stage four and five are critical to things like your immune health, your ability to process emotional experiences, and the ability to take what you learned in a given day and turn it into a long-term memory. If your brain is never able to get into those long cycles of deep sleep, you're interrupting all of those processes. Now, Everyone who works in the medical field will tell you the CPAP might be the most hated medical device out there. But if you've only given it a try once or you tried it or someone you care about has tried it a few years ago, I really want to encourage you to give it a try again. First of all, it's a non-drug related treatment. You're not going to have any side effects from using this machine. You just have to figure out how to make it more comfortable for you. The name of the game with the CPAP is to feel very comfortable going back to the vendor or your doctor over and over again until it feels comfortable to you. Your job is to figure out what are my barriers towards using this thing. People will tell me all sorts of different things. I feel like it's claustrophobic. I feel like it makes me too dry. And they get embarrassed, I think, to go back maybe more than once. We don't want to be seen as pains in the butt. But if you look at the research, people have to go between eight and 11 times to customize that CPAP so that it works for them. And I really want you to walk away from this series knowing how critically important it is to treat sleep apnea. You or someone you know might even have an old CPAP machine in the closet. Now, what I want you to do is don't go in there, dust it off, and try to reuse it again. I really want you to get an updated machine. It's absolutely amazing the advances that they've made in CPAP machines just in the last few years. Now, here's a perfect example. A lot of the folks that I see in my practice will tell me that they felt claustrophobic. They felt like they were suffocating because they had this big mask on their face. They don't even know that in the last few years, they've come out with the nasal pillows, which think of it kind of like a little line of the oxygen. And these two little pillows just sit right in your nose and it's much more comfortable. Doesn't leave you with that feeling like you can't breathe. The other thing that people complain about is feeling really dry. Well, you might not know, but they actually make little tiny humidifiers that can be attached to the CPAP machine that will moisten the air to not make you feel quite so raw when you wake up. Other people were concerned with the big masks about condensation and feeling like they were breaking out a little bit around their mouth. Well, again, these new nasal pillows bring that air and bring it directly into your nose. So if you know someone or you yourself have sleep apnea and it's not been treated, I guarantee you that it is contributing to you feeling foggy during the day and also a little bit more irritable. So you gotta think about yourself and also think about the people around you. Mood symptoms are very commonly associated with memory problems. Now the idea is that these memory problems are not permanent and once we can take away the mood symptom like depression or anxiety, the person's ability to think and process information should get better. A lot of us have stereotypes about what things like depression and anxiety really are. We often just think of them as being emotional. But what psychologists know are true is that there's always cognitive symptoms as well to mood symptoms. So let's just take depression, for example, to illustrate the point. So yes, depression absolutely has an emotional component. Now, I wanna say before I start this, everyone's depression is different, but we're just gonna talk about three generalizations that typically go along with depression. The first one is emotional. So people do tend to feel sad they can feel guilty. They can feel that they're not getting any pleasure out of things. They can feel like, maybe I don't wanna be here anymore. 
but there's also physical and cognitive symptoms. So depression physically can feel like a big weight. It can feel like everything takes a lot of effort. You can feel very tired. People's sleep is commonly disrupted in depression. People's appetite can either be too little or too much. But there's also cognitive symptoms where people with depression say that they have trouble making decisions. It's really hard for them to concentrate and pay attention. Now remember, one of the things you now know is that attention and concentration is the bridge to learning and memory. If we can't focus on something good enough to take it in, we can't possibly make a memory of it. So depression and anxiety can really get in the way of our ability to focus and pay attention. The great thing about mood symptoms is that for many of us, they're completely treatable, either with counseling or with medication. And when the person's mood symptoms improve, the brain starts to feel more clear and their memory can get better. There's actually a diagnosis that goes along with this called pseudo-dementia. And the idea is that the person looks and acts exactly like someone with dementia, but the cause is not a brain disease, something like Alzheimer's. The cause is depression. Certain thyroid conditions that are treatable can absolutely affect memory as well. All of these medical conditions are so important to have identified and treated because if they're left untreated over time, what can happen is people can then develop permanent changes in the brain that are not as easily treatable. One of the things you also learned about is the power of urinary tract infections to affect the brain negatively. If you or somebody you know has had one of these, oh my goodness, you can see this person gets thrown for an absolute loop until they get their antibiotics and the infection in the body starts to go down. This is a perfect example of something that is critically important in the care of older adults. If somebody that you love starts to act very unusual in a very short amount of time, seems disoriented or confused in a way that is not normal for them, the very first thing that you should do is advocate for that person to get a urine screen to see if they have a urinary tract infection. One of the reasons I started the I Care For Your Brain program is that I wanted people having open and honest discussions about brain health and things that really matter to older adults. But one of the barriers that I've tried to teach you in this series that keeps us from talking about these things is fear and anxiety. And this is exactly what the brain fitness industry is preying upon. Americans tell us time and time again as researchers that their number one fear is dementia. Now, I think one of the main reasons that this is the case is that there's a lot of misinformation about what a diagnosis of dementia means. And I wanna cite a couple research studies to you to prove my point. 68% of people polled said that they did not think they would be the same person once they were diagnosed with dementia. One in four people said that the instant they got a dementia diagnosis, they would no longer be able to go out for a walk by themselves. 50% of people said that they would have to stop driving immediately, and many, many older adults said that they feared other people's response to them, specifically that other people would think that they were crazy. The other reason for this fear is just a general lack of knowledge. So many people don't understand exactly what dementia is and what normal brain-related changes are. So one of my personal goals with this series is to try to educate the general public on exactly what happens in the brain as we get older, both normally and also through the different disease processes of dementia. I feel very strongly that knowledge is power. Okay, so now we're gonna transition to the top 10 recommendations that I've made to you throughout the course of this lecture series. The first thing that I want you or someone you care about to do is to optimize your senses. You have to go to the eye doctor every year and I want you to get a hearing evaluation at least once every two years over the age of 60. You have to make sure that your prescription is updated to the best possible range for you and that if you need hearing aids, you get them prescribed and then you actually wear them. One really important recommendation that we've talked about quite a few times in this series is the importance of reducing your vascular risk factors. 
I hope I've helped you understand how things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes dramatically affect the quality of our blood vessels and the ability of our vascular system to move blood throughout our body. Not getting enough blood and oxygen to the brain is one of the number one causes of brain-related changes that are more than normal just for your age. What was important to me in this series is that you had a very good quality understanding of how these conditions actually affect the brain. I think that a lot of medical providers have done a great job of educating us in how things like diabetes affect the eyes, maybe even the feet, and our kidneys. But I think until people really appreciate how these things affect the brain, they might not be as motivated as they could be to make the changes that are necessary to prevent damage. Remember that the smallest blood vessels in the whole body are found in the feet, the kidneys, the eyes, and the brain. These small blood vessels are absolutely critical for optimal health, but they're very fragile and they're susceptible to damage. Once the damage is done to these blood vessels, there's no reversing it. So all of the recommendations that we talked about for vascular and heart health, you really want to try to do as early in your life as possible. Now that's not to say that it's ever too late to start, but the truth is the younger you are when you start to make these changes, the more control you're going to be able to exert over these modifiable risk factors that we've been talking about. One recommendation that you've heard me make over and over again is the importance of moving your body more. Cardiovascular exercise time and time again comes up in the research literature as an evidence-based recommendation for all types of things that happen in the brain. As you now know, there's both direct benefits in terms of improving the vasculature in our brain and indirect benefits in terms of how it affects our mood and sleep. When you look at the combination of these benefits, it really makes exercise a no-brainer, particularly if you're someone who cares very strongly about keeping your brain as healthy as it can possibly be. Now, one of the things that I told you before is this doesn't mean that you have to go out and join an expensive gym or get a trainer. You simply just have to do more physically. You have to move more tomorrow than you did today. Sometimes I work with older folks who have difficulty getting around. They might use a walker, they might be in a wheelchair. And sometimes they feel, I would like to exercise more, but I don't really think I can. As somebody who worked for many years in different types of nursing facilities and has led many a chair exercise group, I really wanna encourage you to think about that differently. My idea is even if you are in a wheelchair, you can absolutely be moving your arms up and down, for example. If you're someone who has a hard time getting up and you found as you got older, you're spending more and more time on the couch, or if you're noticing that in a loved one or maybe a resident who lives in your facility, you can encourage them to stomp their feet up and down as they're sitting, to move their arms up and down, to stretch out their shoulders. Any little movement more than the person would normally do is a benefit. One of the tips that I give to my patients is to say, if you are finding yourself watching TV for a long period of time, every time the commercials come on, let that be your cue to just start marching in place. I promise you that after the course of an hour, you will have accumulated about 10 to 15 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. And if it's not something that you were doing before, well, think about how beneficial that can be over the course of a few weeks. The fourth recommendation is the power of an anti-inflammatory diet. And I encourage you to look more into the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, which stands for Mediterranean Intervention for Degenerative Delay. It's a whole food diet, low in saturated fats and sugar. One of the most important things is that you reduce the amount of processed food that you're eating. One idea is to try to stop eating things that come from a box, as an example. You really wanna to try to eat foods in as close to their whole state as possible so you're getting the full nutritional benefit. In general, for most people, when you're eating a whole foods-based diet, you should be able to get all the vitamins and nutrients that you need without having to take extra supplements. Now, of course, if you've been diagnosed with a vitamin deficiency like vitamin B12 or a vitamin D deficiency, you have to follow 
follow your doctor's orders and take supplementation. The fifth recommendation is to beware of polypharmacy. And what that word means is taking more than five medications per day. Now this is kind of a tricky thing to talk about because remember, I always want you to keep in mind that I am not a medical provider, I am not a physician. So I wanna bring this topic to your awareness, but you absolutely need to be speaking to your physician about any changes that you're going to make. Please do not stop taking any medications on the basis of something that I said. Stopping medications abruptly can be very damaging and even cause something as severe as seizures. With age come changes in our ability to absorb, metabolize, and excrete substances. And it's really important that we understand this, that things that we bring into our body might have to change over time. This includes alcohol. The medications that I want you to be particularly mindful of with age are things like opioids, which are pain medications, benzodiazepines, which are things like Xanax for acute anxiety, and those anticholinergic medications that we've talked about. One of those medications are the PM sleep aids that we can get over the counter. Remember what I said earlier, they have a chemical in it that does the exact opposite of what the memory medications that you get through prescription do. Next time you go to your primary care physician, it's really important that you let them know all of the drugs that you take, not just the ones that you've gotten by prescription. So next time you or you take someone that you care about to the doctor, please bring them a list of all the over-the-counters that you take, all the supplements, all the vitamins. It's really important that your doctor knows exactly what you're taking. Sometimes we forget that over-the-counter medications are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Our sixth recommendation is to prioritize uninterrupted sleep. Sometimes I'll ask my patients, how much sleep are you getting a night? And they'll say, well, I get about six to seven hours. I get about three hours at night, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. That's definitely not good for the brain. The focus is on those long periods of uninterrupted sleep. Now I know one of the things that changes as we get older is that we wake up many more times in the night due to nature calling. If you can get up and use the bathroom and come back to sleep and fall asleep pretty readily, you're probably okay. The people that I worry about are the ones that get up, are exposed to bright lights, and the wheels start turning, and it's very, very hard for them to calm themselves back into sleep. If that's something that's happening to you, you absolutely have to do something about it because during sleep, so many amazing things happen, specifically for memory. And if you're not getting long stretches of uninterrupted sleep every night, I guarantee you your memory is not as good as it could be. One of the things we talked about related to sleep is to be very protective of your exposure to blue lights from different types of screens, particularly in the early evening time. I taught you that those lights stimulate melatonin in the pineal gland of your brain and basically give your brain the message that the sun's up and it's time to get going. This can really disrupt your circadian rhythm, the natural cycle that happens within our brain that tells us when it's time to get up and when it's time to go to sleep. As we get older, there are normal changes that happen in our sleep patterns. Specifically, we get more fragmented and disrupted deep sleep. Now this is concerning to brain scientists because we know it's during these phases of sleep that we're getting the most healthful benefits of sleep. Many people make the mistake of trying to sedate themselves into a good night's sleep with alcohol or over-the-counter supplements. The way alcohol works with sleep is that it might help you get to sleep a little bit faster, but it's absolutely gonna break up the quality of your sleep and you're going to tend to wake up earlier because of it. Sleep medications long-term are really not a solution. And remember, I taught you that some of those over-the-counters can actually be harmful to your sleep. So what you need to do if you don't feel like you're getting long periods of uninterrupted sleep is you have to talk to your primary care physician about it. And you might need something called a sleep study. This is a scientific assessment of your sleep. And remember, as a neuropsychologist, one of the things that I value is the importance of a really good comprehensive of assessment. Until you know what's going on with you or someone you care about, you really don't know how to treat it. 
There's something called sleep hygiene, and brain scientists know that there's six pillars to sleep hygiene. What I want you to do is look at this slide or look in your companion workbook, particularly after this lecture when you have a chance to really read this over in detail. And I want you to apply these things to your everyday life. Now, some of these things are just common sense, like trying to go to sleep and wake up every day at the same time, avoiding late afternoon naps, but until you see it in black and white, sometimes you don't realize that you're actually breaking a lot of rules of sleep hygiene. So I want you to look these over and either make sure that you're putting them into place every day for yourself or encouraging someone that you care about to do these. This is a great place to start before you might bring it up with a doctor or before you turn to some kind of a sleep aid. The number seven recommendation that we learned in this series is the importance of reducing stress and treating mood symptoms. Remember that picture of the brain neuron that I showed you? The one that had come from the mouse that was raised in a really stressful environment and the one that it was compared to that was from a mouse who had a very relaxed environment. What you might remember is that the dendrites or the connections in the brain cells were very different between the two. So if you look at this slide here, you can see that there's a really big difference between the one on the left and the one on the right. What we know is that chronic exposure to stress hormones affects our well being on every level, particularly in the memory centers of the brain. We are living in very stressful times, but it's our responsibility to figure out how we respond to stress. And in that talk, I gave you some really good coping skills to try to look at things different. Specifically, I encourage you to think about stressful things that happen more as a challenge and less as a threat. I encourage you to build your confidence that you have the resources between yourself and the people that care about you to manage almost any stressor that comes to you. If you can really believe that, if you can really get that in your head, that's the power of positive thinking that is absolutely grounded in science. Those things really work. Remember what we learned about stress, that the biggest stressor for most of us is other people? One excellent coping skill that I really hope you took away from this series is the power of assertiveness. It's that sweet spot in communication between being passive and saying nothing and being aggressive and saying too much. You really wanna to try to find that spot in the middle where you're affording yourself and the other person an equal amount of respect. Most stressors that happen between us and other people are when we feel that other people are asking more of us than we really feel comfortable giving. So it's really important that we learn how to respect our own boundaries and communicate that to other people. And remember, we are what we think. This is one of the classic tenets of psychology, that how we think about things is how we then interpret things, and that's the basis of our emotions, how we feel about the things that happen to us. So it's really important that we become aware of the thoughts that we bring to any given situation. We are always prejudging. That is just a part of our human nature. But if we slow down a little bit, I hope that I've given you some skills in figuring out how is it that I'm appraising this situation? What is it that I'm assuming is happening here that might not necessarily be based in reality? Remember that cool study I told you about where older adults remembered more words and even walked faster when they were exposed to more positive words associated with aging, like sage and wisdom, as compared to more negative words like senile and confused? This teaches us that there's a lot of power in the words that we use and that we're exposed to. So if you hear yourself or somebody that you care about making negative statements about their age and their ability to remember, I want you to call them out on it. You might hear people say, at my age, I can't remember that, or what do you expect, I'm 85 years old. I want you to lovingly encourage them to think about it more positively and feel that if they put enough effort in and they focus, they can absolutely remember. Number eight goes back to that concept of cognitive reserve, one of our most critical concepts that we've learned together. I want you to use the three principles of neuroplasticity to make deposits in your brain bank every every single day. And those three principles are that you wanna engage in tasks more and more often, you wanna make them more and more difficult over time, and you wanna increase the novelty or the uniqueness of the task. A lot of what we know about neuroplasticity, which means the brain's ability to change itself, 
to grow new brain cells, and much more realistically, to grow new dendrites or connections between brain cells is based on animal research. And what we know is if you look at the brains of animals who engage in difficult tasks that get harder and harder incrementally, these are the animals that have the stronger brains. And this is even true in animals that are very, very aged. So what we know is that age is not a barrier towards neuroplasticity. Any person at any age can increase the amount of cognitive reserve. And remember, cognitive reserve is your best chance at fighting back against brain diseases like dementia. Number nine, you have to be a social butterfly, but in your own way. I definitely am not saying that everybody should go to parties and that's going to be great for your brain. For some people, they might actually find that to be a very stressful event. But what I want to encourage you to think about is that we are social animals fundamentally, and we have to figure out what works for us socially. We can't assume if somebody doesn't want to be around people on a consistent basis that they're missing out on this important part of brain health. Remember that research study that I told you about, that there's a big difference in people that feel lonely versus people that are isolated in terms of risk factors for brain changes, including dementia. It's really the people that are alone and feel negatively about it that do poorly. There are some people that are just solitary by nature. Now that absolutely doesn't mean that they should be living alone somewhere with no connection to the social world. Even the most introverted people need a small, supportive, trustworthy group around them that they can depend on if something happens to them. Researchers reported that the loneliest people in one study experienced accelerated cognitive decline approximately 20% faster over 12 years than people who are not lonely. So one of the ways you can combat this is by asking yourself or a loved one a very direct question. Do you feel lonely? Do you wish that more people were around you? This can be one of the biggest benefits of retirement communities, is that the person is much more integrated into a community, into a social world, that events and activities are brought directly to them, meals are shared, we're much more likely to be able to engage in group activities. All of these things are very, very beneficial just from the social aspect alone, never mind what it is that we're doing when we're with other people, say like a group exercise class, for example. Of course, the cardiovascular benefits are fantastic, but we do not want to downplay the importance of being with other people, looking people in the eye, having back and forth conversations, laughing and smiling. This is part of being vitally engaged with life, and this is critical for brain health. And the last recommendation is that I really need you to be cautious about the brain fitness industry. You can't trust that everything you read in the marketing is true. They are trying to use fancy scientific words to make you think that these products have an evidence base. When I've taught you that there's not one product on the market today that has a strong enough scientific basis that I would feel comfortable sitting here encouraging you to buy it with your hard earned money. I hope that you've learned that the primary goal of the brain fitness industry is to sell you a product. It's to sell you a brain game. It's to sell you a supplement. The interest is not in your genuine brain health. And remember, true brain health is never going to come from a quick fix. It's not going to come from one pill, and it's not going to come from one app or one game. It has to be a holistic and integrated approach to brain health that respects physical health, mental health, spiritual health, and social health. I want you to question two good to be true conclusions. Do you really think after being with us for these last nine lectures, that one tiny little pill that has not undergone any type of rigorous scientific investigation is really going to live up to its claims of reversing something like Alzheimer's disease or making sure that you don't develop Alzheimer's disease? These claims are not accurate. Remember those two attorney generals that I told you about? They called the two most popular brain fitness products on the market today clear-cut frauds. 
So here we are at the end of the lecture series. You did it! You now have all the tools to think like a brain scientist. Thank you so much for letting me be your trusted guide on this brain health journey. When I started this program two years ago, I had four markers of success that were really important to me, and I sincerely hope that you felt that this is what we've achieved together. I wanted you to feel educated, empowered, engaged, and that this information really made an impact in your everyday life. But the learning doesn't stop here. I want to continue this conversation with you. So please join me in my Facebook groups or on my website. Thank you so much for your attention. It's truly been a privilege.